believe that the Baptists are the original Christians. We did not commence our existence at the Reformation. We were reformers before Luther or Calvin were born. We never came from the Church of Rome, for we were never in it. But we have an unbroken line up to the apostles themselves. Charles Spurgeon Where did the Baptists come from and where is our origin? One theory says that we originated as reformers in the 1600s. In 1609, a church was established by John Smith over in Amsterdam, and later he moved on to England and started Baptist churches there in England as well, and that was our origin. However, there's a lot of evidence to show that Baptist churches existed both in England and elsewhere long before that time. Down through the ages, we've been called by many different names, but essentially our doctrine has remained unchanged. We've been called Paulicians, Donatists, Albigenses, and of course Waldenses. We're going to take a look at these early Christians called Waldenses and find out a little bit about their origins and what they believed. There are those that say that the Waldenses began in the 1100s as a church started by Peter Waldo and that his followers were called Waldensians because they were called after his name. However, this actually seems to be the reverse of what happened, that the Waldenses existed long before Peter Waldo and that he was named after them because he was one of their great preachers. In fact, there is a great deal of evidence to trace the Waldense roots back to the time of the apostles in the book of Acts. The Waldenses spread throughout Europe and were called by many different names depending upon where they lived and who they were being called by. From the time of the apostles up until the 1500s, these people, the Waldenses, held Baptist doctrine. The Waldensian church today largely holds Reformed theology and many of them in America are part of the Presbyterian church. Pope Francis recently issued an apology to the Waldenses and has sought to bring the two churches together. Modern Waldensian doctrine comes from a compromise that they made with the Reformers in 1532 at Chanfran. At the Synod of Chanfran, the Waldenses joined the Reformation and adopted Calvinist Reformed theology. Later on, they also adopted infant baptism, both of which historically they did not believe in. The book Martyr's Mirror was written by Thielman J. von Braut in 1660. In this book, he speaks of Waldensian doctrine and says, the Waldenses, who in all respects were of one belief with the Baptists, also called Anabaptists. This now raises a serious question. Many Protestant denominations claim the Waldenses as their ancestors. So then, who's right? Well, in a way they all are. Many of the Protestant denominations actually came to their convictions through studying the Waldenses and their doctrine. They were all aware of the Waldensians' existence, and as we saw, joined hands with them in the 1500s. To say that no one else can trace their roots back to the Waldensians would be untrue. What we are talking about is where did they stand doctrinally. In his book, Von Braut quotes Sebastian Frank, a writer from the early 1500s, who says, The Waldenses were divided into two, or as some maintain, three divisions, one of which in all points held the same tenets with the Anabaptists, that is, the Baptists. Having all things in common, they baptize no infants, they do not believe at all in the presence of the Lord's body in the sacrament, a little before this, he says, they invoke no saints or creatures, but only God. They do not swear at all, yea, they regard this as improper for a Christian. They also have no images, and do not bow before or worship them. They allege that the sacrament ought not to be worshipped, but Christ at the right hand of his Father, and God in spirit and in truth. They suffer no beggars among them, but help and assist each other as brethren. William Cathcart, in his Baptist Encyclopedia, quotes Renarius Sacco, an infamous persecutor of the Waldenses in the 1200s, who says this of the Waldenses. They say a man is then first baptized when he is received into the sect. Some of them hold that baptism is of no use to little children, because they are not yet actually able to believe. Clearly the Waldenses held to believers' baptism much as Baptists do today. They did not baptize infants. This, however, tells us nothing of their mode of baptism. Was it by immersion like Baptists do today? There is not much written about this because it wasn't really an issue at that time. History records baptism by immersion as the general practice up until about the 14th century. Baptist historian John T. Christian wrote of this in the 1800s. He writes, It is equally clear that the form of baptism was immersion, 
This was, at the time, the practice of the whole Christian world. The great Roman Catholic writers affirmed that immersion was the proper form of baptism. Peter the Lombard, who died A.D. 1164, declared without qualification for it as the proper act of baptism. Thomas Aquinas, who was one of the most prominent Catholic theologians of the 13th century, refers to immersion as the general practice of his day, and prefers it as the safer way, as did also Bonaventura and Duns Scotus. These were the great doctors of the Roman Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. Mesere, the French historian, is correct as to the form of baptism when he says, In baptism of the 12th century they plunged the candidate into the sacred font to show what operation the sacrament had on the soul. We could go through all the other distinctives to determine that the Waldenses were Baptists in doctrine. However, just seeing that they practice baptism for believers only by immersion is the doctrine that most clearly makes them Baptist. There are two other important doctrinal questions that I need to deal with at this point. The first is whether or not the Waldenses were Calvinist. Even the latest estimates of when the Waldenses came into existence predate Calvin by about 400 years. Calvin's doctrines, however, were not new. The Roman Catholic Augustine presented similar arguments in the 4th or 5th century. The evidence, however, suggests that the so-called doctrines of grace were not introduced to the Waldenses until the time of their compromise in 1532. Alexis Mouston, author of The Israel of the Alps and a 19th century expert on the Waldenses, states the following. The Vaudois, which is another name for the Waldenses, hastened to send to the reformers some of their barbas, George Morel of Freysenier and Peter Masson. Of this meeting with the reformers, they made this statement. And as to predestination, we are much troubled about it, having always believed that God created all men for eternal life, and that the reprobate only become so by their own fault. But if all things take place of necessity, so that he who is predestinated to life cannot become reprobate, nor those who are destined to condemnation attain to salvation, of what use are sermons and exhortations? From statements such as these, it would seem that the doctrines of grace, Calvinism, or Augustinianism were a new concept to the Waldenses that they had trouble accepting. J.T. Christian, in fact, points out that the Compromise of 1532 was due more to practical considerations on the Waldenses' part rather than doctrinal, and that it represented a large doctrinal change to the Waldenses. He writes, Every institution has its vicissitudes, and after progress comes decline. On the eve of the Reformation, everything was on the decline. Faith, life, light. It was so of the Waldenses, Persecution had wasted their numbers and had broken their spirit, and the few scattered leaders were dazed by the rising glories of the Reformation. The larger portion had gone with the Anabaptist movement. Sick and tired of heart, in 1530 the remnants of the Waldenses opened negotiations with the Reformers, but a union was not effected until 1532. Since then, the Waldenses have been pedo-baptists, which means they baptize babies. The other doctrinal question I wish to address is whether or not the Waldenses were actually Sabbath keepers or not. One of their alternate names was in sabbati. The primary meaning of the Latin prefix in is not, opposite of, or without, meaning that the Waldenses were not Sabbath keepers. There is an alternate meaning which is the exact opposite, which would indicate that they were Sabbath keepers, and it is the meaning which is preferred by the Seventh-day Adventists who try to support the idea that they were Sabbath keepers and therefore predecessors to the Seventh-day Adventists. However, it must be understood that this name is one applied to the Waldenses by their enemies, namely the Establishment Roman Catholic Church, and the Sabbath they are referring to is the Sunday meeting of the Roman Catholic Church, not the Saturday Sabbath of the Jews. The point to this was that they did not attend Roman Catholic services. It has nothing to do with the day on which they met. To suggest that they actually were Sabbath keepers would require more evidence than just this word. In Martyr's Mirror, von Brat says, also, as they observed no other day of rest or holiday than Sunday, they were styled in sabbati or in sabbatis, that is, Sabbathless or not observing Sabbaths. But they stood for this book, and they were willing to lay down their lives for it. The Waldenses, as we will see, are a perfect demonstration of the cost of serving Christ. But their faithfulness through it all should be an inspiration to us. In Ephesians 3.21 we read, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen.
The Bible clearly teaches that the church would exist with an unbroken lineage from the time of Christ until the rapture. In Matthew chapter 16, we find Peter's confession of who Christ was. In verse 16, it says, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. In verse 18, we find the Lord Jesus agreeing with that confession of Peter when he says, And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The Lord Jesus promised that his church would prevail against even the gates of hell, and to suggest that they had gone out of existence for any period of time would mean that the gates of hell prevailed against it. As a result, we should be able to look back through history and see that unbroken lineage. It may be obscure at times, and many times we find that the only records that are kept are those of the enemies of the church that have tried to destroy it. But there is evidence throughout every age that the true gospel-preaching church continued to exist. Dutch Reformed theologians and historians A. Epeg and J. J. Derma wrote the following. These, these two men, which I, I, the, I have some quotes here, these individuals and the, the next individual that we're going to quote, what is interesting about them is they are not Baptists. They were reformers. And yet the statements they, that they make are very interesting. So let's take a look at this. All right. So those two individuals wrote, We have now seen that the Baptists, who were formerly called Anabaptists, were the original Waldenses and have long in history received the honor of that origin. On this account, the Baptists may be considered as the only Christian community which has stood since the days of the apostles and as a Christian society which has persevered pure the doctrines of the gospel throughout all ages. They wrote that. They were Reformed theologians, which basically means that they held Presbyterian views. They were Calvinists. And yet they said it's the Baptists through the Anabaptists and originally the Waldenses that held the pure doctrine all through the ages th since the time of Christ, since the time of the apostles. They make that statement and they, that's not even their church. So that's interesting. And then Johann Mosheim, uh, he's a German Lutheran historian. He wrote in the Westminster Dictionary of Church History, which he personally was called the father of modern church history. He lived from 1694 to 1755. This is what he wrote. The true origin of that sect which acquired the denomination of Anabaptists by their administering anew the rite of baptism, those who came over to their communion, is hid in the remote depths of antiquity and is of consequence extremely difficult to be ascertained before the rise of Luther, Luther or Calvin, there lay concealed in almost all the countries of Europe. He goes on. Many persons who adhered tenaciously to the following doctrine, which the Waldenses, Wycliffeites, and Hussites had maintained, that the kingdom of Christ, or the visible church he had established upon earth, was an assembly of true and real saints, and ought to, therefore to be inaccessible to the wicked and unrighteous. So he's talking about how the true doctrine came down through all the ages, through the Waldenses, the Wycliffeites, and the Hussites. The Hussites, they were in the 1500s. The Wycliffeites, they were in the 1400s. The Waldenses were prior to that time. We'll talk about their origins in a moment. All right, but he goes on, the same author, Mosheim, he goes on to say this, many of the Paulicians, Baptists in belief and practice, and predecessors of the Waldenses, Albigenses, and Anabaptists, left Bulgaria and Thrace and formed settlements in Italy, and later almost all the provinces of Europe, and formed gradually a considerable number of religious assemblies who had adhered to their doctrine, who were afterward per persecuted with utmost vehemence by the Roman pontiffs. That's another word for popes. So, again, he wrote that in that ecclesiastical history from the birth of Christ to the present time in 1726. Johann Mosheim wrote that. So, again, a man who was not a Baptist, but yet is recording history and saying it was the Baptist that held these views all through time through the Waldenses and others. In the time of the apostles as recorded in the book of Acts, the church started out in Jerusalem but through persecution was forced out into other areas. 
Eventually, as was intended by the Lord, they began preaching unto the Gentiles, and many non-Jews were converted to Christ. In Acts 11:19-21, we read, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. This represents the first large-scale instance of the gospel going to the Gentiles. Eventually, the gospel begins spreading throughout Europe, to include the region of Italy, as evidenced by the book of Romans and other passages of scripture. History tells us that the persecution that began in the book of Acts continues on for many more centuries. As a result, it is recorded that nearly all the apostles met violent deaths at the hands of their persecutors. Believers in the book of Acts were simply known as Christians. This term was first used of them in Antioch as we see in Acts 11.26. However, in the years that followed the book of Acts, the true Christians began to be known by other names. Oftentimes these names were based on where they lived or a well-known preacher that established their movement. Many times, these were just different names for the same group of people. There is evidence to suggest that the Waldenses may have been one of the first of these groups to exist. In fact, that is the belief of the modern-day Waldensian church as portrayed in the Trail of Faith Museum in Valdez, North Carolina. The display in the museum makes the following statement. In 58-59 to AD, apostles of Christ plant seeds of Christianity in the Waldensian valleys as they travel across the Cadian Alps into Gaul, France, and other parts of Europe. They teach that the apostles themselves brought the seeds of the gospel into the region of the Waldensian valleys, after which the Waldenses were named. As persecution in Rome and other parts of Italy began to mount, it is believed that many of the believers fled to these remote valleys for protection. The protection came from the mountains surrounding them in this remote location they had selected to settle in. Severe persecution continues throughout Italy and other regions but those who had fled to the Waldensian valleys experienced a period of relative peace and calm. It was during this peace and calm that they were able to carry on one of their great works for which they were known, that of preserving the word of God. The Syrian Bible translated into the Greek Vulgate, which became the Italian Italic Bible, was translated in A.D. 157. This Bible translation preserved the pure Syrian text, which had been handed down since the time of the Apostles, and had now fallen to the Waldenses. Many historians attest to the Waldensian use of the pure biblical text throughout their history. It was to the Waldenses that in the 1500s the world turned in order to obtain the best manuscripts during the Reformation period. These manuscripts led to the Olivetan Bible, which was the basis for the Geneva Bible and ultimately the King James Bible. We will discuss the Olivetan Bible when we get to that period in history. The Trail of Faith Museum also makes the following statement regarding the Waldensian connection to the Apostles. During the Dark Ages, from a remote valley high in the Cadian Alps of northern Italy, early missionaries went forth to carry the light of the gospel throughout Europe. They were the Waldensians, the oldest known Protestant group still existing in the world today. It is felt that the light of their faith was kindled by the Apostles themselves who traveled through their valleys on their way to evangelize France and other parts of Europe. Olivetan's preface to the French Bible affirms the Waldensian claim to have enjoyed and possessed the heavenly truth contained in the Holy Scripture ever since they were blessed and enriched therewith by the apostles and ambassadors of Christ. When asked how old their faith is, for generations Waldensian parents have told their children from time immemorial. Persecution of the Christians during this era was carried on by the pagan Roman Empire, but at the end of this age, that is about to change. The Roman Empire of the 4th century found itself in disarray. The title of Caesar was being fought over by four Roman generals, one of which was Constantine I. At the Battle of Milvian Bridge, which took place right outside Rome in AD 312, Constantine defeated his brother-in-law, Maxentius, which allowed him to gain the title of Roman Emperor. What was notable about this battle was an event that happened before it began. Constantine claimed to see a vision before the battle. He saw a burning cross blazoned across the sky with the Greek words that in English would be translated in this sign conquer, written below it. He took this to mean that he was to conquer the Roman Empire in the name of Christ and allegedly became a Christian at that time. 
going into battle and defeating his enemies gave him the impetus that led to the creation of a new church, which would later become known as the Roman Catholic Church. It was to be the universal Christian church to which all believers must belong. Initially, this seemed as a good thing for believers in Christ, as they thought this would end the persecution against them. But very soon it was found that the Roman Catholic Church would create the greatest persecution that has ever occurred against true Christians. Constantine and his successors quickly proved themselves to be no friends to the true believer in Christ. The next period in time is generally known as the Dark Ages, and is characterized by the rise of the Roman Catholic organization and the suppression of other faiths, in particular, true Bible-believing Christians. It is also a time when the scriptures were forbidden to the common man, and the translation of them punishable by death. During the Dark Ages, Bible-believing Christians, whether they were called Waldenses or by another name, were heavily persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church. This unholy union between church and state had absolute power and would accept no challenge to its authority. The main challenge to their authority, however, was not a particular church or group, but the very scriptures themselves. The Waldenses had preserved the Byzantine texts of the Bible, as handed down from the church in Antioch in the first century. The Roman Catholic institution would now make a change to that by accepting the Alexandrian family of texts, which had been generally rejected by the church up to that time. The source of the Alexandrian text was from a teacher named Origen, who lived in Alexandria, Egypt. He produced a copy of the Bible that he called the Hexapla that contained six different manuscripts of the Bible which he had written and that contained progressively worse corruptions in each. Origen did not believe in many of the cardinal doctrines of Christianity and that was reflected in his Bible. Constantine, who was the founder of what became the Roman Catholic Church, ordered a man by the name of Eusebius to produce 50 copies of a standardized Bible for all Christians to use. The text which he used was the Alexandrian text produced by Origen. It was a corrupt text written by an heretic, and it was rejected by those outside the Roman Catholic Church. This later was translated into Jerome's Latin Vulgate in A.D. 382. The Syrian or Byzantine texts that were preserved by the Waldenses eventually became the King James Bible that we have today. The Alexandrian texts of Origen, Eusebius, and Jerome are the basis for virtually every new version of the Bible that has existed since the 1800s. Of the Waldenses during this era, Baptist historian James Beller makes this statement. This group of soul-winning Christians was known by various names, including Cathari and Paterines. They used the Itala Biblia for their rule of faith, and they flourished in spite of excommunications, banishments, imprisonments, torture, and death. The Cathari were the ancestors of the famous Waldenses, whose written history begins in the 1100s. It is an accepted fact that the Waldenses and the ancient Cathari were one and the same. They were Baptist in doctrine and practice. In the 7th, 8th, and 9th centuries, regarding the Vaudois, the French name for the Waldenses, James D. McCabe says, Their missionaries were everywhere, proclaiming the simple truths of Christianity and stirring the hearts of men to their very depths. In Hungary, in Bohemia, in France, in England, in Scotland, as well as in Italy. They were working with tremendous, though silent, power. Lollard, who paved the way for Wycliffe in England, was a missionary from these valleys. The Albigenses, whose struggle with Rome forms one of the most touching episodes in history, owed their knowledge of the truth to the Vaudois missions. In Germany and Bohemia, the Vaudois teachings heralded, if they did not hasten, the Reformation, and Huss and Jerome, Luther and Calvin, did little more than carry on the work begun by the Vaudois missionaries. It is during the period from 1100 to 1532 that we know the most about the Waldenses as we're interested in them. Following that time, those who held Baptist doctrine were largely absorbed into the Anabaptist movement. Those who remained, unfortunately, left their traditional teachings and joined with the Reformers. Around 1160, a wealthy merchant from Lyon, France, named Peter Waldo, began to preach against the false doctrines of the Catholic Church. As part of his ministry, he gave all his possessions to the poor, and his followers began to do the same. Thus, they became known as the Poor Men of Lyon though some believe that the Waldenses derived their name from Peter Waldo. The truth is that they existed long before him, and it seems more likely that he derived his name from them because of his association with them. He became one of their great preachers. The Waldensians of this time were known as the people of the book because of their love of the scriptures. <laughs> 
Baptist historian William Cathcart wrote this. The Waldenses loved the scriptures, could repeat entire books with ease, sometimes the whole New Testament, every word from Matthew to the last verse of Revelation. They could quote the whole thing. That was William Cathcart wrote that in the Baptist Encyclopedia. And that was in 1883 that was published. So, and I've even got the page number if you want to look it up. So, all right. Um, and then John Tyler Christian, J.T. Christian, says this. The Bible was a living book, and there were those among them who could quote the entire book from memory. The entire book from memory. That's how much they loved the scriptures. Another development among the Waldenses in the 1100s was the establishment of the College of the Barbi. Their preachers, they were called the Barbas. They were traveling evangelists and preachers, but the word Barba means uncle, as opposed to the Roman Catholic father. Waldenses did not like the idea of that kind of authority, so they called them Barbas, which was more like an uncle rather than a father. A father has authority. An uncle is just that guy that, you know, comes and helps you and, you know, gives you advice and that sort of thing. That's the relationship that they wanted their preachers to have with their people. So they were the uncles, the Barbas. And they were preachers, and they went around. Uh, they actually established schools in these Waldensian valleys to train up their preachers and for aspiring barbas. The young preachers would train in these schools for two to three years. During those two to three years, in the wintertime, they memorized and studied scripture for 18 hours every single day, seven days a week. And all through the winter, you know, the rest of the year they had to, you know, work on the farms and do everything. So they were probably still studying during that time. But in the winter time when they weren't farming, they weren't doing any of that stuff, 18 hours a day. That means they studied the scripture and they slept. That's about it. All right. And they studied other languages in order to translate the Bible into those languages. They studied French, they studied German, they studied all the different languages that were in Europe at the time in order to get the Bible to those people because that was their burden. But the life expectancy for a barba, 18 months. To surrender to preach in their community was a death sentence because they would go out and they would go into these other lands and other, they would go out into uh, these cities and that were controlled by the Roman Catholic Church and they would quietly preach. They would go out, they would, they would go out as peddlers. They would sell things or would, they would be artisans. They would do uh, various things. And then on the side, they would talk to people about the scriptures and they would, they would hide bits of the scriptures so that they had that available to, to show people and to talk to people. But the average lifespan after they went out from their villages out into the world to try and spread the gospel, within 18 months, they were caught and sentenced to death and killed. That was the average. So these young men, probably your age, that surrender their lives to train for the ministry for two to three years, doing it 18 hours a day, that you would have 18 months to live the rest of your life, and then you'd be killed. My young student, let me remind you that peddling your tools, trinkets, and cloth is just the cover for our real peace. Selling of the pearl of a great price. But Barba, how will we know when it is safe to speak the words of life, and when it is not? First, we must pray for the Holy Spirit to give you discernment, wisdom, and protection. And then rely on the Lord. I will show you. You, you sir, I see you are interested in the trinkets I have to offer today. But I have a precious jewel of a far greater value that I would show you. If you would but stop for a moment and allow me to show you my wares. When the people were curious enough to ask to see the jewel, the barber would ask for protection from the priests. If the people promised protection, the wise barber would then share from his memory. 
I have a brilliant gem from God that lights the fire of God's love in the heart of the one who owns it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. When the people saw the sincerity of the faith of the Waldensian missionaries, many of them believed. These early two-by-two -two missionaries bravely shared the gospel, and they left behind rays of light from which grew many churches. Beginning in 1530 and culminating in 1532 with the Synod of Chanfran, the Waldenses began negotiating with the reformers over combining forces. Unfortunately, there were some major differences between what the Waldenses believed and what the reformers believed, and the only way to strike an agreement was to compromise with them. When it comes to doctrine, compromise never works well, and it did not in this case either. J.T. Christian makes this comment about the compromise at Chanfran. Sick and tired of heart, in 1530 the remnant of the Waldenses opened negotiations with the reformers, but a union was not effected until 1532. Since then, the Waldenses have been pedo-baptists which means that they baptize babies. Orchard says the following, It is certain that the ancient Waldensian church subsisted at the Reformation and that they left off baptizing adults on their profession of faith. Whether all those churches of the brethren ultimately fell into the Lutheran community and consequently were comprehended by imperial law cannot be positively decided. It is plain here that the patience of the saints was worn out. Daniel 7.25 It appears the assistance rendered them by able divines and which enabled them to conclude there was no need to rebaptize, regulated the conduct of many. Yet the Baptists were still a scattered community, and were named now Anabaptists and Pickard Calvinists. As we said earlier, infant baptism was not the only point of contention between the Reformers and the Waldenses. Historian John Horsch records the following. In 1530, the Waldenses sent two of their ministers, George Morel and Pierre Masson, to Switzerland and South Germany to confer with the Zwinglian leaders and to ask for their instruction and counsel. A letter was written by Morel in the name of the Zwinglian party among the Waldenses in France and Italy. The letter stated the Waldensian position on various points of doctrine and practice. Among the statements made in this letter is the mention of objections raised by the Waldensians to the denial of free will and to the doctrine of predestination as taught by Luther and Zwingli. Nothing has brought us such consternation, the writer of the letter states, as this doctrine. He adds that they had supposed that divine grace is offered freely to all, and that man himself is responsible for spurning or accepting the offer of grace. There was one positive outcome of the compromise at Chanfran. The Bible manuscripts that the Waldenses had preserved all these centuries now fell to the reformers who had greater means to get it out to the world. Pierre Robert Alevetin was a Waldensian pastor from Noyon in Picardy, France, and he was a cousin to John Calvin. He took the Waldensian Greek and Hebrew texts and translated them into French. In the year 1588, the Olivetan Bible was published. This became the basis for the English Geneva Bible, which is often considered a forerunner to the King James Bible of 1611. The Waldensian love for the scriptures had paid off, and they were in large part responsible for the crowning achievement of the Reformation, which was the King James Bible. If there is one thing above all else that the Waldenses are noted for, it is how they patiently suffered at the hands of their persecutors and yet still maintain their testimony for Christ. cave church where the Waldenses used to meet to escape persecution and despite its cold and damp features the acoustics in here are very good and it would have made for a quite an experience for them to be meeting here for church beautiful place 
Unfortunately, it became a deadly place as the soldiers at one time trapped the people inside and then forced them out by pouring down fire of some kind and smoking them out of here and then killed them as they left the cave. Waldensies, what did it cost them to have their faith? I don't know if you can see that picture real well. It, it is a, an engraving of three people being burned at the stake. Sufferings of the Waldensies, they suffered greatly for their faith. Let me give you a warning. The rest of this class today, it, there's a passage that I'm going to read from a book that may be a little bit disturbing. But here's the thing. It's something we need to remember. It's part of our heritage. It's part of the cost that was paid to give us this book and the doctrine that comes from this book. And it is a price that if we forget, it's kind of like we talk about, you know, like Memorial Day. You know, we can't forget the, the sacrifice of those who, who uh, bled and died to, to give us the country and the freedoms that we have. Well, we can't forget those who bled and died to give us the word of God, to give us pure doctrine, to give us, give us salvation. It's important. Now, salvation comes from Jesus Christ, but that message has been handed down through the centuries this way. So, Alexis Mouston, he wrote a book called Israel of the Alps, The Israel of the Alps. It was published in London in 1875. The excerpt that I'm going to read you is from page 106 of that book. There is not a town in the Piedmont. So these are the mountains that we were talking about. There is not a town in Piedmont, said a Vaudois Barba in his memoirs, in which some of our brethren have not been put to death. Jordan Tertian was burned alive at Susa. Hippolyte Rossier was burned at Turin. Villermin Ambrose was hanged on the Col de Miam. Ugon Chiamp of Fenestrel was taken at Susa and conducted to Turin, where his bowels were torn out and flung into a basin without his sufferings being terminated, even by this frightful torture. So he lived through that portion and finally died eventually. Peter Gamenot of Bobi died at Lucerna with a living cat in the interior of his body. Mary Romain was burned alive at Rocheplatte. Madeleine Fontaine suffered the same fate at St. Jean. Michael Gonet, a man almost 100 years of age, was burned alive at Sarcena. Susanna Michelin, at the same place, was left in a dying state upon the snow. Bartholomew Frack, having been hacked with sabers, had his wounds filled with quicklime and expired in this manner at Fenil. Daniel Michelin had his tongue torn out at Bobby for having praised God. Oh, that was a terrible crime. James Baradon died covered with brimstone matches, which they had fastened between his fingers and about his lips, his nostrils, and all parts of his body. Daniel Ravel had his mouth filled with gunpowder, which was set on fire, and the explosion of which tore his head in pieces. Mary Mounin was taken in Combe of Liosa, in the, the flesh of her cheeks and of her chin was removed so that her jaws were exposed, and in this way she was left to die. Paul Garnier was slowly mangled at Rora. Thomas Marguet mutilated in an indescribable manner at Fort of Mirabouk. All these things that he's described, and this is indescribable? I'd hate to think what they did to this poor guy. And Susanna Jacquin cut in pieces at Latour. A number of young women of Pelleray, in order to escape the outrages still more dreadful to them than death, flung themselves from a precipice and perished among the rocks. Sarah Rostignol was cleft up through the middle of her body and was left in a dying state on the roads from Arial to Lucerna. Anne Charbonnier was impaled alive and borne in this state like a banner from Saint-Jean to Latour. At Passien, Daniel Rambaud had his nails torn out, then his fingers were cut off, then his feet, and his hands were severed by blows of hatchets, and then his arms and legs were separated from his body upon each refusal that he made to abjure the gospel. Every time he refused to say, I will renounce Christ, they cut off a little bit more and a little bit more. And yet through all that, he remained faithful and did not deny Christ.
the lessons of our history. What we believe is real. It's true. And it's worth dying for. People have died for it in the past. People are going to die for it in the future. In some countries, people are dying for it already. It's worth it. Hebrews 11.35, we read this passage last week, says this, Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. It's these people did the same thing. They were tortured, not accepting deliverance. They were tortured, they were killed, they were burned at the stake, and they had all kinds of other horrors inflicted upon them for, the, for what they believed. <laughs> we have it easy. But in the past, belief cost something. It used to cost something. Uh, you know, when, when I said I, I surrendered to preach, and, you know, I, I started, I went through Bible college and did all that, and, you know, all that, what did it cost me? Oh, it cost me some money. It cost me some time and effort. 18 months their preachers lived. There were no lukewarm Christians. There was no such thing. You believed on Jesus Christ, your life was on the line. People were killed. Uh, these Waldenses, the, the, the armies of unbelievers marched up into the mountains chased them into caves, slaughtered them wholesale, wiped out entire cities, wiped out... They suffered for what they believe. What do we suffer? If we forget our past, we forget who we are and what we stand for. You know, I've got that YouTube channel, and on it I talk about how if we forget who we are, if we forget our past, that's how they can change our doctrine change what we believe, change who we are, change our music, change everything about us, because we forget that this was the price that was paid, and that we need to stand for what's right. If we forget who we are, we compromise like the Waldenses in 1532. And if we lose who we are, then we can be changed into something else. One last story from Mustan, and we'll be done. This is from the same book, Israel of the Alps, by Alexis Mustan. And in this story, Mustan writes, It was in the town of Carignan that the executions commenced. A French fugitive by the name of Marathon was first seized. The commissioners enjoined him to abjure his religion if he would escape death. In other words, if he just renounces his faith in Christ, that he would be allowed to live. But he preferred to die, it says. We give you three days to reflect, said they, but after that time you will be burned alive if you refuse to come to Mass. That's the Mass of the Catholic Church. The family of Marathon were more distressed than himself. He had married a Vaudois woman. Remember the Vaudois were the Waldenses. He had married a Vaudois woman. His wife applied to the commissioners for leave to see him. Their response... Provided that you do not harden him in his errors, said they, I promise you, she replied, that I will not speak to him except for his good. Sounds like a loaded answer, wasn't it? The commissioners never thought of any greater good than life and conducted the young woman to the prisoner in the hope that she would persuade him to prolong his days by a recantation. But the courageous daughter of the martyrs dreaded, on the contrary, that her husband might be induced to follow that course out of affection for her or through human weakness, and, that, and the good which she wished to do him was to confirm him in his resolution. Accordingly, says our old chronicler, she exhorted him in the presence of the commissioners as earnestly as possible, steadfastly to persevere in his religion without putting the death of the body, which is of brief duration, in the balance against the eternal salvation of his soul. The commissioners transported with rage on hearing language so different from what they had expected upon her part, loaded her with reproaches, but she unmoved, earnest, continued to address her husband, saying to him with a firm and gentle voice, Let not the assaults of the wicked one make you abandon the profession of your hope in Jesus Christ. Exhort him to obey us, or you shall both be hanged, cried the magistrates. 
And let not the love of this world's possessions make you lose the, the inheritance of heaven, said the Christian woman without pausing in her calm tone. Heretical she-devil, they exclaimed, if you do not change your tone, you shall be burned tomorrow. Would I have come to persuade him to die rather than to abjure, she replied, if I could myself seek to escape death by apostasy? You should fear, at any rate, the torments of the pile. I fear him who is able to cast both body and soul into a more terrible fire than that of your billets. Hell is for heretics. Save yourselves by renouncing your errors. Where can the truth be if not in the words of God? This will be the destruction of you both, said the magistrates, if that name can be given to such cruel fanatics. Blessed be God, said the woman to her husband, because having united us in life, he will not separate us in death. Instead of one, we shall have two of them to burn, sneeringly muttered the executioner's satellites. I will be thy companion to the end, the heroic woman simply added. Will you come to mass and have your pardon, said the magistrates again. I would much rather go to the pile and have eternal life. If you do not abjure, Maturin shall be burned tomorrow, and you three days after. We shall meet again in heaven, replied she mildly. Think of the delay that is granted you. The length of it is of no consequence, for my resolution is for life. Say rather it is for death. The death of the body, but the life of the soul. Have you nothing else to say to us, you obstinate wretch? Nothing except that I beseech you not to put off my execution for three days, but let me die with my husband. Her request was granted. She had entered into the prison a free woman, but remained a captive, and only came out again to mount the pile. The name of this woman was Joan, and this name pronounced in such circumstances involuntarily recalls that of Joan of Arc. Why should not the heroism of the Christian woman be admired as much as that of the young female warrior of Orléans? Ought the victims of faith to be less thought of than those of battle? Alas, one may more readily become illustrious in this world by taking the lives of his enemies than by giving his own for the love of the brethren. But those who do so give their lives, do it not with an eye toward worldly glory. The two martyr spouses had their last evening of prayer and meditation to spend together on this earth. It is pleasing to think that it cannot have been the least sweet of their evenings, for Jesus says, Wherever even two shall be met in my name, I will be with them in the midst of them. And when were the conditions of that promise ever more completely realized than at that hour? Next day, being the 2nd of March, 1560, a pile was formed in the public square of Carnegie, and there these worthy confessors of the gospel died, holding one another by the hand and with souls united in the love of the Savior. And the two of them were burned at the stake. Let us be likewise in our faith. That's the faith that people had up until the freedoms that we have today. We have freedom in our churches. We can gather together. We can meet. We don't have to, have to fear police coming in and arresting us for our faith. We don't have to fear any of those things that these people suffered. But this is the exception to the rule. What we saw here, that is the rule of history for standing for what we believe. And when we see the price that was paid, we need to ask ourselves, what price are we willing to pay? We need to remember the Waldenses. We need to remember what they suffered for their faith. We need to remember what they stood for, and we need to continue standing for it because it is what we believe as well.